Uh, but as we do gather today for this celebration of Mass in October, um, and we are getting real close to our next Sunday's Feast of the Christian Family, the Prime Bishop has a uh, webinar, a YouTube presentation on Wednesday. Um, I will send out electronically the, uh, the information you need to con or get on and access that. And uh, obviously, if you don't have a computer, you're not on my email, you don't need that information, so it will only be sent out electronically, and that will be on Wednesday, and then next Sunday is our Feast of the Christian Family. Uh, but this Sunday, uh, I ask all of you to, at this time, please make <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, a private examination of your conscience. And then we now set to continue here together. I confess to Almighty God, one in the Holy Trinity, who knows the innermost secrets of my heart, that I have sinned in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my fault, by my own great fault. In your presence, O God, I publicly express sorrow for the many sins by which I have offended you. I resolve to amend my heart, to improve and sanctify, endeavoring henceforth you faithfully all the days of my life. I ask all those who dwell within the Church of Christ, the Blessed Mother Mary, the Holy Apostles, the Martyrs, and Faithful, who have lived, suffered, and died for the Gospel of Jesus Christ, as well as you, my brothers and sisters, to witness my confession and pray for me to our Lord God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, absolution, and the remission of our sins. May our Lord Jesus Christ absolve you, and with his authority vested in me, I absolve you from all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Show us your mercy, Lord. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant most gracious Father, that with purity of heart, we may worthily fulfill this holy action, established in remembrance of the Last Supper and the death of Jesus Christ, and for our sanctification and salvation. Be present among us, Jesus, our most perfect Master, because you said there were two or three are gathered together in my name, you are among them. We also ask, Lord, that through this holy liturgy, we may experience a spiritual revival and a better understanding of your holy will bringing us together in one great family, guided by your commandments and by love, truth, and justice. And may we all say together, let us pray to the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, indivisible, revealed in triune power for all time, now, and forever. Glory to God in the highest, Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and God, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord our God, increase our faith, so that none of us shall live in contentment, knowing that our neighbor is in need. Fill us with the sense of duty, who may always follow your holy will. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The reading for this morning's Holy Mass is taken from the second epistle to Timothy. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, 
but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord or of me his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. This is the word of our Lord. Thank you. Blessed are those servants who have baptized vigilant on his arrival. Amen, I say to you, he will gird himself, have them recline at table, and proceed to wait on them. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If anyone wishes to be first, he should be the last of all and the servant of all. Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, as you cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. In your mercy, cleanse me so I may worthy proclaim your holy gospel through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips that I may worthy proclaim this holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the holy gospel according to St. Luke. And the apostles said to Jesus, Increase our faith. And Jesus replied, If you have faith even the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your servant who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, Come here immediately and take your place at table? Would he not rather say to him, Prepare something for me to eat. Put on your apron and wait on me while I eat and drink. You may eat and drink when I am finally finished. Is he grateful to the servant because he did what was commanded? So should it be with you. When you have done all that you have been commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what we are only obliged to do. Here, this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise It doesn't mean that it's, 
it's not going to come out even when you're a Christian. You're going to come out on the losing end of the scale because you are supposed to be a giving person. It's counter-experiential. Jesus says if somebody asks you to forgive him one time, that's fine. If he asks you to forgive him seven times, that's great. If he asks you to forgive him 77 times, you have to do it. It's counter-experiential. We are a counter a whole bunch of stuff. Christianity is just not what we expect. And because of this, these contradictions appear when we go about our everyday lives, or at least we should. What Jesus teaches us is not what we would expect, and that's probably because Jesus is trying to get us to listen and pay attention to the Word of God, and what God thinks is normal is not necessarily what we think is normal. And when that Word of God is heard with our human ears, we are going to run into contradictions. Then the question is, this is all that faith is about. Are we going to listen to us, or are we going to listen to Jesus and the Word of, of God and all of those contradictions? Camille just shared with us a reading um, that was about the earliest time in Christianity, that's their first or second generation. And in that reading it says, God did not give us a spirit of cowards. You know, back in the days of Timothy, and now those days are back again, we Christians we absolutely have to be frank and open about our faith. We have to make the contradiction of Christianity stand out because those contradictions, they are not so clear anymore. In Timothy's day, if you were a Christian, your neighbors knew that you were different. Now we're basically, you know, out here in South Deerfield, under the Wakeley, whatever, you know, we're basically a Christian community. If we had an Hasidic Jewish group in town where they dress differently and they act differently, you would know it. If you had a fundamentalist Muslim group in town, you would know it by the way that they acted, the way that they dressed, when they went to worship and when they didn't. They would stand out. Well, earliest Christians stood out in the Roman world, and it's actually, in a weird way, coming back to that in our world. If we are really Christians, and I don't mean really just check it off on a survey. If we are really Christian, people will know that we are really Christian. They will see that we are different kinds of people. And one of those differences is what you're doing right here, right now. Church. I was born in 1960, which just seems so, so long ago for so many of the kids that we talked to. 1960. That was Vietnam War, which makes me a part of the baby boomer generation, which was following World War II. So when I was a kid, you know, even this age or younger, I was up here as an altar boy in St. Joseph's in Westfield. 81% of Americans were practicing Christians. When I was a kid, my parents had to go out on Saturday to get milk because all of the stores were closed on Sundays. You couldn't go down to a Cumberland Farms and get milk. Everything shut down on Sundays because church was a priority. My home parish in Westville was right on Main Street. And there was very little parking around the church, but across the street was a store. And so on Sunday mornings when we went to church, we had no problem with parking because the store was closed. It was Sunday. We had all of those parking places. The percentage of families who went to church was by far the largest segment of the population. Hardly anyone didn't have somewhere to go on a Sunday morning. And things have sure changed since then. Now just over half of us are church practicing Christians. According to Pew Research, 52% of us are practicing Christians. And you know that as well as I do. Think about your family, think about your friends, think about your schoolmates. I bet you for here in New England, because we are one of the least religious practicing groups in the whole country, I bet you it's more than one for one. So if you're here, I bet you know more than two or three people who don't go to church. And within this 52%, the youngest generation, the millennials, there is within that 52% we count religion important, the millennials, there is a group that feels very important, that religion is very important to them. And an even larger, within that 52%, now remember, not the whole group of millennials, but within that 52%, religion is very important, and they pray daily. But then all of a sudden, the story changes. For every young person within that millennial group, again, the 52% that goes to church, not the 48% that don't, but within that 52%, the millennials, they pray daily, religion is very important to them, 
but for every one of them that goes to church on a weekly basis, there are two that go once a year, or not even once a year. There are young people who count religion important. They pray every single day. They know that God is there. They know there's something inside of them, but they don't feel it here in church. And I know one of the reasons. So a little boy was listening to a long and excessively boring Sunday morning sermon. Suddenly, this red sanctuary lamp caught the little boy's attention. Tugging on his father's sleeve, the little boy says, Daddy, when that light turns green, can we please get out of here? <laughs> so every priest knows that there are serious challenges to keeping young people, keeping people in general, engaged in the worship. We're reading from a book, we're reciting the script, and we do the same script every week. And for a lot of us, it means a lot. It means a lot to me. And I know a lot of you have some objections to the new liturgy. I do too. And if you have them, share them with me. Put them in writing. Tell them to me. And since we're one of the only churches that does this Hoder Canon, I will share them with Grant and the Liturgical Commission. And who knows? Maybe we can change things. Change is not evil. So if you're not really liking what we're doing, tell me about it. But to get people engaged in worship is very, very hard. How many of you will say, i got to come up here and sing solos, and you know what my voice sounds like. Don't be afraid to be engaged in worship. But I think the declining numbers in worship, they say more than just something about how we worship. The largest single group in America today in the religion survey has become, and I bet you already know this, the unaffiliated. They register at 36%, which is more than the percentage of Catholics in the United States and more than the percentage of Protestants in the United States. And what makes the change even more dramatic is that the unaffiliated group is the fastest growing group in America. This probably means that those percentage numbers of 52% practicing Christians, 36% unaffiliated people, those two numbers are going to grow closer and closer together, and they may not in the too distant future even swap places. And they may be unaffiliated will be more than the practicing Christians combined. And this is going to make church precarious. This church building here, this beautiful building, was erected in 1929 by faithful people right on the verge of the Great Depression. Only five years earlier than our building, a beautiful church was built in Newtonville, Mass, out east. That church was once the home of a congregation of people who came together to find worship in Christ because it was important to them and to get strength and inspiration for them. In that way, it is no different than what we are. Now that congregation is gone, and that church has been turned into 11 $1 million condoms. Now, I don't know if anyone cried when that church closed. I don't know if anybody cared when all of those baptisms and weddings and funerals and, and times of people in prayer and worship, I don't know if they cried. But I don't know even if the city of Newtonville, if it is a city or just a village, I don't even know if they noticed its passing. But the transformation of that church into 11 $1 million condoms, that earned accolades from Builder Magazine, which named that property its top choice for adaptive reuse. So they took the church, they took all of the God stuff out of the church, they kept the structure, and now people have 11 $1 million condos, and it won accolades for adaptive reuse. Is that what reuse is going to be? Are we going to fade away so that some millionaire can buy this building someday and make it into a gorgeous home? I have to wonder if this is a small-scale version of what's taking place in society at large. We're impressed by million-dollar stuff, no matter what the million-dollar stuff is, but we are no longer that impressed by church. And here is one of those contradictions. Church is suffering because it may not be an exciting place as going out and playing sports on a Sunday morning, watching sports on a Sunday morning. I think you know I don't do football, but I know that football are afternoon and evening Sunday games. But there are free games that are on right now getting people around. How can you give up, well today not a perfect example, but a beautiful fall day. How can you sit down and watch 10 hours of football on a beautiful fall day? But people are giving up on church because of watching sports, playing sports, going out to a nice breakfast, lingering in bed just a while longer, or even because it takes away some of that free time and we just don't have a lot of free time. But it also may be suffering, sad to say, 
because an increasing number of people just don't see the value of going to church. Think of those millennials. They count church as, or religion is very important. They pray every day, but they don't see why they need to come together. We don't get or profess the contradiction that is, is Christianity as well as we should if people don't get church. And this is why we who are here need to remember that God did not give us a spirit of cowardice. Now, exactly like in the time of Timothy, we can no longer have the luxury of being silent. We can no longer expect a guy with a collar or even an FCAT camera to do our work as Christians. We can't take church for granted because if we do, then this house of God, like so many others, could become, someday, somebody's fancy conduct. I've always loved church, and I know it's like that with many of you here. Even before I was a priest, even though I wanted to become a priest since I was eight years old, I did not feel good. It just did not feel right if I did not go to church. And I then, I know it's like that with many of you here. And I'm hoping this is not only because of the generation I was born into, I hope it's because of church because of the contradiction that this offers to all of the noise and the nonsense out there. And if this is the case, then we're going to have to grow in our commitment to hear on Sunday mornings. We're going to have to make Sunday morning choices based on church first and other stuff second, at least some of the time. We're going to have to increase our volunteerism. We're going to have to increase our generosity because God did not give us a spirit of cowards. You know, I know I'm running long. This is the last thing I'm going to say. There's a word, avocation. Avocation means a hobby. And an avocation means the opposite of vocation, which is a calling. So there's like atypical, anormal, apolitical. That a means the opposite of. So avocation is pulling you away from your calling. It's a hobby. This is a calling. This is a vocation. It can't be a hobby. It can't be an avocation, something pulling us away. We can't come here only like on occasion when we feel like it. There has to be something that draws us here that makes us need to be here. That's the calling that Christianity is. That's the contradiction that Christianity is. And then finally, I haven't forgotten what I started with. If you haven't figured out what that intentional contradiction was in today's Mass, well, I ran out of time now, but I have Bible study tomorrow. And so you're more than welcome to come to Bible class tomorrow night from 7 to 8 and we can talk about the contradiction of this morning's Mass and the contradiction that is Christianity. And for these things we pray in Jesus' most holy of faith. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty oh, Lord, as we gather before your altar on this first Sunday of October, we do offer our prayers in remembrance of Officer Walter Decision, who was killed on this day 40 years ago. We also offer our prayers uh, for Henry uh, Sanorski, uh, who died on Saturday, September 24th, and this is being offered by Jenny DeMera and family. We continue to offer our prayers for those battling cancer, Meg Connors by Ellen and Don Sprosky, Randy Clement by Grandmother Dottie Baronis, Carl Dickinson by Joe and Peg Kuschuk, Fathers Ray Drader, Jan Gilchek, and Maurice Lizelle is offered by myself, Richard Poe is offered by the Poe and Foster families, two-year-old Jack Sela is offered by Marianna Foster, Frank Sprosky, the twin brother of Don is offered by the Sprosky Gates and Kirkendall family, and Liz Bridgman, recently diagnosed with cancer and raising three young girls on her own, is offered by Cindy Benjamin. Are there any intentions you would like to offer from the congregation? back there, and uh, we're going to wish her a happy birthday at the end, but her sister Cammy up here wants to wish Sophia LaFleur a happy six, six years old already? Six years old, and that is offered by her grandmother, her grandfather, mother, father, and her sister Cammy. So, back there, Sophia, happy birthday from all of us. Are there any other intentions? Nope. 
For all the intentions that we keep privately in our thoughts at this time, Lord, and for all the ones that we just mentioned, we all ask the Lord to bless each and every one of us here gathered, uh, to you those who are perish who are unable to with us here today, and those who are perish who have chosen not to with us here today. And for these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. May the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, all that is seen and unseen. I believe in the one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being of the Father. Through him all things are made for us and for our salvation. Down by the power of the Holy Spirit, who is born of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under conscious pilot, and suffered death in his air. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end.
God, the Almighty Father. Amen. God, our Father, receive the gifts we offer you today and guide us that we may faithfully serve you. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God. Forever and ever. as we are one, 
I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be made complete. Father, all those you gave me, I would have in my company where I am to see this glory of mine, which is your gift to me, because of the love you bore me before the world began. I myself am the bread of life. No one comes to me, no one who comes to me shall ever be hungry. No one who believes in me shall ever thirst. And after these and other words of the archpriestly prayer and with holy fervor, our Savior took bread into his holy and venerable hands, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed you, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which is given for you. In like manner after supper, taking this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again he gave thanks to you, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which shall be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, mindful, we, your servants and your faithful people, in remembrance of this Christ, your Son and our Lord, as well as his blessed passion, resurrection, and his glorious ascension, receive from your own gifts and presents a pure offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance, as from him who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts and with an unshakable faith that they will become for our souls a saving remedy. We humbly ask you, Almighty God, to command that our offering be brought by the hands of your holy angel to your highest altar into the presence of your divine majesty. That we who receive the most sacred body and blood of your Son from this altar may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and who have passed on to eternity. <laughs> to these souls, Lord, and to all who rest in Christ, grant everlasting light, and to those who are in life, straight from the path of righteousness, unmindful of your fatherly love, Mercifully shorten their suffering, we ask this in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope in the greatness of your mercy, some part and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, and with all your saints who shed their blood for your name. Their hearts were always open to justice and mercy, and with lives patterned after their divine Master, merited eternal joy. Number us in their company, Lord, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. But whom you always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and freely give us all these good things. Through him, and with him, and in him, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Forever and ever. Let us pray, instructed by our Savior's teaching and following divine example, we say with confidence. <laughs>
Deliver us, Lord, from all evils, past, present, and future. And by the intercession of the blessed and glorious Mother of God, Mary, together your blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, as also Andrew and all the saints, grant us peace in our day, supported by the help of your mercy. May we always be free from sin and secure from all disturbance. Through the same, Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. May the union of divinity and humanity in Jesus Christ bring us sanctification and eternal life. Amen. The Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give. Do not look at our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant you the peace and unity of your kingdom. You live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, your death brought life to the world. By your holy body and blood, free me from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful to your teaching, and never let me be parted from you, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the partaking of your body and blood, Lord Jesus, not be caused by judgment. Though I am unworthy to receive this great sacrament, through your loving kindness may become my safeguard and healing remedy. My saving master awaken in me, living faith, fervent love, a worship, adoration, and a holy longing. Through this communion, make me your willing servant, zealous to fulfill your holy will. May it at last unite me entirely with you, my Lord and my God. Grant this who lives reigns with God the Father in the unity with the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. I will take the bread of heaven, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but you can only say the word, and I shall be healed. May the body of the Lord Jesus Christ bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Shall I return to the Lord for all the graces that He has rendered unto me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praise will I call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy to see you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
body and the blood of Christ. The 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 body and the blood of Christ.
Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as ransom for the men. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, may our faith grow through the true graces of your holy word and of this holy Eucharist, and may they lead us to be willing servants for our neighbors, that we may attain unto the kingdom of God. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. sacrifice which I, though unworthy, have offered in the sight of your majesty be acceptable to you. Through your mercy may be effective for myself and all of those for whom I have offered it through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Almighty God bless you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs>